Am I here by myself? How is everybody doing today? Oh, okay, there you are, there you are. If you're blessed and you know it, clap your hands. If you're blessed and you know it, shout amen. If you're blessed and you know it, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So good to be in the house of the Lord today. So good to have each of you here. We're honored. We're honored that you join us online as well. God is good. He's better than good, and we just came to give him glory. We came to give him praise and honor today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that, God, that you love us and that you are God and that always have our best interest at heart. So today, God, we just want to love on you. We want to love on you, God, and give you glory, give you honor, because you're worthy. You're worthy. Somebody just put that in the atmosphere. You're worthy. You're worthy of praise, God. Now we say heal today. Mend today. Just have your way in this place, God. Have your way in this place. We give our hearts to you today. We give our minds to you today. We turn it all over, God. We turn it all over to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let every heart shout amen. We're chasing after you today, God. Oh, 
There's no boundaries to your greatness. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. You're not done yet. From generation to generation, there's no boundaries to your greatness. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. You're not done. Help me say that. From generation to generation. singing back to us you're not done yet the Lord says that even as some of you that seems like the road's been tough and the tests have been long and the trials have been heavy the Lord says you're not done yet so he says it's time to stand back up and it's time to get back on the horse and it's time to ride again with the Lord the Lord says that you're not done yet and every place in your life that you feel like I am done I'm finished 
I, I don't have it in me to do it again. The Lord says, you're not done yet. It's time to step up, stand up, and get back on and ride again with the Lord. Because there's much yet for generations to come for you to do just as well as what I have to do, says the Lord. The Lord says there's much yet to come. So stand up and arise and let's get going together, says the Lord. Good. generation to generation there's no boundaries to your greatness no eye has seen no ear has heard you're not done yet generation got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my head, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing high. I just want to move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my head, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a heart. Nothing else fit 
Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those arms. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, let's sing it out one more time. Come on, my soul. Come on, my soul. Don't you get, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those arms. Get up and Lift up your heart.
my heart will say how great is our God. Name of all names. Give myself. 
the difference between praise and the sacrifice of praise? This is one of the differences. When it takes everything inside of you to stand up and praise the Lord, that's a sacrifice of praise. And we've all been there at different times. But what I sense this morning is there were multiple people that this morning you came with a sacrifice of praise. And I just sense such a tenderness from the Lord to the sacrifice of praise. He loves the praise, but there's a tenderness in his heart for you when it's a sacrifice of praise. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we honor you this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises, oh God, that are yes and amen because you're good and you're faithful and you're true. We thank you for intervening for our nation, God. We thank you for intervening for our families, God. We thank you for intervening for, for Florida and for this region, God. We thank you that you are good and everything you do is good. Lord, I thank you for great faith being poured out today. If you just need a touch from the Lord, just, just lift your hands. Lord, I thank you for pouring out, even right now, God, great faith, great trust, great hope in Jesus' name. Lord, we release great faith and great hope and great trust. We bless the sacrifice of praise. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for that breaker anointing that breaks open and, and cuts through, divides what needs to be divided, but also brings together that which needs to be brought together. We thank you for healing. We thank you right now for the healing power of the Holy Spirit poured out, multiplied out over this body. Lord, we receive your healing. We receive all that you're pouring out, oh God. children were young they were expected to take naps because it was good for them and it was good for me <laughs> naps were very beneficial for the future of the day they set the tone for the rest of the day and I'd say to them it's time for your nap and I'd be all excited <laughs> and every now and then somebody would say mom do we have to do we have to take a nap and whenever, I, whenever they'd say that, I'd say, you don't have to take a nap. No, you get to take a nap. But all they could hear was they had to take a nap. They just had to take a nap. It was the perspective that they had. They needed it. It was good for them. It was beneficial to all involved. It provided for future prosperity of the soul, theirs and mine. And it's the same for giving. You don't have to give. You get to give. 
you get to give, and then because you've given, you get to reap the wonderful benefits that he pours out to us just because we're obedient to him. He just tells us to be obedient, then we're obedient, and he just pours out on us. But when he pours it back, it's pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. You know, our God, our God, our God is the best example of a giver. <laughs> the word says in um, 2 Corinthians, let giving flow from your heart, not a sense of religious duty, but let it spring forth freely from the joy of giving. All because God loves a hilarious generosity. That word hilarious doesn't mean what to us. What it means today, it doesn't mean that there. There it means joyous with a sense that you've already been persuaded. You're not having to be talked into giving. You're not being coerced to give or whatever it is that you're doing. But you are ready and willing. You're ready and willing. The Amplified Bible says it this way, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly because you think you have to, or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and he delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. You know, giving often starts out of obedience because you respect and you honor the Lord and, and, and you just you, you want to do that. And that's a good reason. That is a best reason. But then as you grow and you mature, because you have repeatedly seen the goodness of God in your life and you begin to love him more and more, then your heart is changed and you want to give. And see, now we've gone from I have to give to now I get to give. Because you love the Lord and you remember his goodness and his faithfulness, you may even begin to look for ways to give, to give your money, your time, your effort, your talents. Because now you have such a love connection with the Lord that you can't wait to please him. And then there's that reaping and sowing. You can't wait to please him, so you give, and then he gives it back to you. And then you give some more because... You just want to please him, you know, and it's that sowing and reaping process. And just like everything else in the kingdom, it all boils down to the heart. So we have to check our hearts. So just ask yourself. I have to ask myself things. Why do we give? Why do I give? Why do I do what I do? Is it out of religious duty? Is it because I know he's faithful? That I know he's always good and trustworthy to do exactly what he says he will do? Because he loved you first. Because he loves you best. He already paid a high price for us. He's already given us his very life. He gave it for us. So we choose him, we choose to follow his very powerful example of giving. I believe Jesus, this is my paraphrase, but I think his heart would say, I didn't have to give my life. I didn't have to. I got to, just for you. Because it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom with all its promises. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom with all his promises. You know, the word says that his promises are yes and amen. Yes and amen. So, Lord, today we just, we love you. We thank you. You, we thank you for changing our hearts. We thank you for giving us a heart checkup whenever we need it. We thank you for the 
for what you're giving today and what you've already given, Lord, and what these these wonderful people are going to give today, Lord, that you would use it and you would bless it, that it'd be powerful planted into the kingdom, powerful planted. two ways to give. You can give online securely, and then you can give in person. So just take a moment. You know, this is the worst part of the service for me. I love to worship. I don't know about you, but can't you just feel his tangible presence in this room? Golly. It's like the living room. I could just bask here all day long. It is so awesome. Father, we just release you right now to move in and out of these aisles, up and down these rows to do inside of us, Father, what only you can do. Daddy, we love you today. We thank you for your tangible presence. Father, there's things that have happened this morning that only you know. As you reached down into our soul and touched us, kissed us with a mark from heaven. Father, I just ask God that you would just Continue to be able to do what you do best. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. All right. So this morning, I'm kicking off a new series called The End in the Beginning. Sounds a little bit different, doesn't it? I think it's going to be key for what, is, what, what the Lord has in store for the days ahead. You know, what's amazing, it's an interesting title um, because one of the biggest things that happens after our salvation um, in our development and our relationship with God, um, one of the biggest hindrances does not come from demonic influence and it does not come from um, anything spiritual in nature. It actually comes from us. So in this series, don't think that I'm minimizing spiritual things. Because I do recognize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I recognize that there's principalities and powers that we battle against. But I believe there's some things that God wants to do in us and he wants to be able to do through us to enable us to understand the greatness of who he is. And, and I believe that we're going to see something incredibly begin to take place inside of our lives. So turn to your neighbor say, get ready. Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, turn to your neighbor and say, are you in anyone? He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become made new. You see, one of the things that we have to understand is what is it to be a new creation? You know, the Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans where he talks about the renewing of our mind. Because you see, as a new creation in Christ, we've got to learn to allow our lives to be able to line up to what it is that God has. You see, there is a, a you version of you, 
and then there is a God version of you. And sometimes the gap between the two is very large. And what God desires to do in our walk with him is to be able to close the gap so that we begin to see ourselves not as, as through the lens of, of our past, but to begin to see ourselves through the lens of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to be pulling a series out of the book of Ruth. Some of you may not um, have ever read the book of Ruth, but trust me, when this series is over, you'll have a clear understanding of the book of Ruth. Let me give you the backstory. I'm going to give you the first chapter, and then we're going to jump into the second chapter. But in the first chapter, there was a famine in the land, and, um, and, and Naomi has a husband named El- Elamech, and here he removes the family from Bethlehem, and they go to Moab. Um, and there, while, he, while he's there, his wife Naomi has two sons, um, Mahalan and, and Kailan. And both of these sons um, begin to take wives. One son takes a, a woman by the name of Orpha, whose name means gazelle. How many of you know that girl could run? <laughs> and then Ruth is, um, um, is one of the daughter-in-laws, and her name means friendship. But while they're there... Um, Naomi's husband passes away. And not only does her husband pass away, but over a 10-year period, both of her sons pass away. And so here she's she's there, and she is um, very depressed. She has lost everything that was near to her. And and I'm just going to pick up in verse 16 of chapter 1. They won't have it for you on the screen. But here Ruth is trying to be able to, I mean, Naomi's trying to be able to get her daughter-in-laws to be able to go back to their homeland. Because you see, both of her sons took um, women from Moab. That it was an idolatrous country. They did not serve Jehovah. And as a result, they, they took these, these, these wives. And so she turned to them and said, listen, I'm old. You know, and a, port, a part of that custom is if she had another son, that son would marry one of their, their, their widows. But she didn't have any more sons. And so she turned and she said, I'm old. I can't have no more babies. And if I could have another baby, you, you don't want to be able to wait till he becomes a man to be able to wait on him to be able to marry him. So she encouraged them to be able to go back to their homeland. And Orpha goes back. And Ruth chooses in verse 16, she says to her, I entreat you not to leave me. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. And so at that point, Ruth chooses to be able to go with Naomi because Naomi hears that in Judah, in the area of Bethlehem, that God is moving. As a matter of fact, the famine is broken, and an abundance begins to come back into that area. And so Naomi turns to to Ruth, and she tells her, no longer call me Ruth, but call me Mara, which means bitter. You see, she became bitter because of the death of her husband and the death of her two sons. But when we look back over Naomi's life, this was a pattern. It was a cycle. How many of you know when we come to God, we've got to be able to break patterns. We have to break cycles. You know, God wants to be able to cause some things inside of us to be shaken for the purpose of us becoming all that he's called us to be. So she turns and she says that she's going to settle into this statement inside of her life and she's going to be known as the bitter woman. You see, she had two sons and I don't know what was happening because the Bible doesn't give the narrative of what was taking place in her son's lives. But one of her sons, which was um, named Malan, literally means sick. You see, back in the Old Testament, you name your children based upon the circumstances surrounding you. And if that wasn't enough, her son Chilon literally means pining. Or suffering from a mental, physical decline, especially because of a broken heart. So she was blinded because of the fact of what she had gone through, and she was not open to allow the God that she served to be able to cause triumph to come out of tragedy. So here here Ruth goes with Naomi. They come back into the area of Bethlehem, and here's where I'm going to pick up in in chapter 2. They'll have it for you up on the screen. I'm going to read the first seven verses. It says, Therefore, there was a relative, Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Emelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go into the field and glean heads of grain after those whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. And she left and went and gleaned in the field of the reapers. And she happened to come a part of a field belonging to Boaz, who was, the family, who was of the family of Emelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the servant 
who was in charge of the reapers, who's this young woman? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, this is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and, was, and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little while in the house. You see, what happened is that Naomi got up one morning and she realized that here I've got, uh, uh, Ruth got up one morning, I have Naomi here and she's bitter. But we're perishing. We're broke. We don't have any food to eat. So she turns to her and says, let me go out into the field and let me at least get us some grain so we can begin to eat. You see, Naomi was rehearsing over and over and over again the reasons for her bitterness. And one of the things when we come to Christ and we begin to understand that we are a new creation, we've got to choose to allow our minds to be renewed. We, have, we cannot allow the patterns of yesterday. And how many of you all got patterns? Every one of us have patterns. And I told you guys last week that, that I never met my biological father until I was 23 years old. There's some patterns that are there. And those patterns can be carried out from generation to generation. Or when we come to Christ, we can allow the blood to be able to cleanse us and to break off those generational curses that we may call them. And so Ruth decides to leave the bitterness and get the blessing. So she takes the initiative as a beggar to go up and to be able to get the scraps after the harvesters, the reapers. So the reapers are coming through the field. They're harvesting all of the crops. And as they're harvesting the crops, behind them were the, the beggars, the, the people that were, that were very um, um, poor, that, that, were, that were wanting to come behind them. And if they missed something, they could pick it up and, and, and be able to take that thing home to be able to eat. And so she, she goes into this field as a beggar. She didn't know that it was Boaz's field. She didn't even know who Boaz was. But you see, God was setting the stage. God's always working behind the scenes. Don't ever think that God has forgotten you. God's setting the stage for a blessing to come into her life. God is setting the stage to be able to take that thing which seemed like it was nothing but death and all of a sudden be able to turn it around. Because you see, inside of the kingdom of God, there are levels. Let me say that again. Inside the kingdom of God, there are levels. Here, she's a Moabite woman. She's a foreigner. She's from a heathen land. She worships gods that are false gods. And here she comes into the land. And the first day on the job, the first day on the job, you could almost hear them saying, don't give her another minute of attention. Because you see, even those that would come into the field, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And, and all of a sudden, those that were gathering behind the reapers, they would fight each other. Because it was a survival of the fittest. They had to be able to have food to be able to survive. And here she comes into this field, and she's gone from an idol worshiper to where now she's choosing to submit herself to the God of Israel. I want you to be able to take notice of God's source of blessing. Let me pick up in verse 8. It says, then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter Will you not? Do not go into another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. You see, I don't know who these young women are. I don't know if they're, if they're Boaz's maidservants, if they're his concubines, if they're a part of his reapers. I don't know who they are. But he's saying to them, you stay close to these young women. And what he's telling her is do not go into another field. You see, sometimes when we come to Christ, we've got to be able to disassociate ourselves with some people. Some people that are going to take us into other fields. Some people that are going to take us out of the blessing of God. You see, Boaz recognized there was something very unique upon her. He had heard what had happened with Naomi, that she lost her husband and she lost her two boys. And he had heard that this Moabite girl, this woman, chose not to be able to go back to her family, but to be able to travel with Naomi. And he had heard that she had said that your people will become my people and your God will become my God. And he noticed her. How many of you know God is always taking notice? But he turns and he wants to know about this girl. And so he asks other people about her. Let me say something to you. Sometimes God's asking about you. Sometimes God's asking other people about you. 
Sometimes God's setting the stage for favor to come into your life that you don't even know what's going on. Here we have Ruth out in the middle of the field, and while she's in that field, doesn't even recognize that the owner of that field is off to talking with the servant of the reapers and saying, who is this girl? He's checking on her. Why was she spotlighted? She was spotlighted because God was working on her behalf. You see, we have to understand something, that the greatness of what God wants to do inside of us is not going to come necessarily because of our faithfulness, but it's going to come because he is the one that's faithful and true. I wish I could tell you that perfection is what brings the blessing, but it's not. You know what brings the blessing is recognizing that he's the source of our blessing. Recognizing that he's the one that's working behind the scenes. He's the one that's, that's moving parts around. He's the one that's making us noticed when we don't even know that anybody's noticing. I, I don't know what that, what that looked like for her. I know that it was very laborious because the Bible says that she had to be able to take rest. And she had to be able to go and refresh herself. But here we turn and we recognize that God's moving on her behalf. She was being noticed. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're being noticed. So Boaz invites her to stay under his protection and under his care. She's no longer going to walk behind the reapers, but listen to this level up. She's now sitting with them. She went from picking up scraps to getting the good stuff. I don't know about you, but I love the good stuff. I love good favor. I love good contacts. I love good opportunities. I look for the good stuff. You know, see, sometimes what can happen inside of our lives is we can walk right by the good stuff. As a matter of fact, we can believe inside of our heart. You know, the Bible says, as a man believes in his heart, so is he. We can believe inside of our heart that the good stuff is never going to come to us, and we can walk right by the good stuff that God, just like those reapers here, you're going to see in a minute that Boaz turned to his men, and he said, listen, as you're, as you're reaping, as you're gleaning, I want you to be able to every once in a while drop a little something for her. I want you to be able to put a little something there. And, and all of a sudden, they're walking a couple feet in front of her. And she's like, oh, look at that bundle. And she's picking it up. Oh, look at that bundle. And she's picking it up. That's exactly how our heavenly father is. If your earthly fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? You see, we have a mindset to where all of a sudden, you know, God wants us to be able to walk as children of the king. We begin to look for those opportune moments. We begin to look for that favor. We begin to look for God to move inside of our lives. But if all we ever can see is our job, just over broke. If all we can ever see is that opportunity being snatched from us at the last moment. If all we can ever see is somebody else being spotlighted while we're put out into the shadows, that's all we'll ever see. And we'll walk right by opportunities that God has given us. I, I don't know what was happening in the mind of Naomi when all of a sudden there in, Mo, in Moab, you know, Na, in the mind of Ruth when, Noah, when Naomi's trying to be able to get her to go back home. Something on the inside of her was telling her, there's more. There's more. She made a critical decision to be able to say, your God will become my God. And she chose to be able to seek him, begin to follow him. You see, we've got to be able to recognize that God wants to be able to give us the good stuff. He wants our focus to become upon him. He wants us to expect favor to go before us. He wants us to be able to expect that contracts are going to be um, signed, that, that, that opportunity is going to be able to come in front of us. He, he expects us to be able to rise to the top. You know what's amazing is that every job before I got into the ministry I ever had, I always floated to the top. I always got pay raises, promotions. And people would turn to me. They were, they were like, man, how in the world did you do this? And I would tell them this very simple key, if you're writing this down. If you're, if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. I would always put God first. I never worked for a salary. I never worked for an hourly wage. I worked for God. So it didn't, ma didn't matter if I was making a minimum wage. It didn't matter what my salary was. Everything I did, I did unto God. And because I did it unto God, the God uh, is, is the source of blessing. His blessing was going before me. You see, I believe God wants us to get to a place where we continually seek him and put him first. So all of a sudden, she's overwhelmed by the blessing. And in verse 10, it says, So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. 
and how you have left your father and mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know. The Lord repay your work and a full reward. Turn to your neighbor and say full reward. Be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come in refuge. Let me keep going. Then he said, let me find, find favor in your sight, my Lord. For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly of your maidservant, though I am like, I am not like one of your maidservants. Then Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here, eat the bread, dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, now she's equal with them, and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied. Turn to your neighbor and say satisfied. She went from being hungry to being full. And kept back some. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded the young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Don't stop her. Let her get all she wants to be able to get. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. For us, we don't understand these weight measures in biblical times, but an ephah of barley was basically 50 pounds of grain. And all of a sudden, she shows up, and her mother-in-law was starving. She was in full survival mode. So now she's not just full. She's not just, she's went from starvation to being full, but now she's also moved into overflow. To where people that are around her now are starting to be blessed because of the actions that she has made. So she comes back to her mother-in-law's house. And her mother-in-law is, 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 if I can use the South Georgia term, flabbergasted. And she's, she's overwhelmed. And, and so she, 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 she went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave it to her of what she had kept back that she would be satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed is the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law whom she had worked. And her mother-in-law said, whoa, hold on for a second. That man, he's a relative of ours. That's Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi, Naomi said to her, this man is a relative of ours and one of our close relatives. And Ruth the Moabitess said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until you have finished all of my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go not out with young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So stay close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest in the wheat harvest. And she went with her mother-in-law. You know what I love is that sometimes we come to, to, to Christ and, and all of a sudden we want a little dabble do you. And as a result of having a mentality of just, you know, getting close to the blessing, we never experience the full reward that, that here Naomi experienced. You see, God wants us to realize that, that he does give a full reward to his children. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, that we will receive a full reward. Well, if there's a full reward, then there also must be a partial reward. And if there's a partial reward, there must also be no reward. You see, I believe in this series, one of the things that God wants to do is he wants to shift the way that we see ourselves. You know, what's the difference in one that, that it prospers and one that does not? Most of the time, it's their focus, whatever they, they focus upon. You know, it's a, it's a level of confidence that they have inside of their heart, their ability to be able to understand that, that God wants to do the exceedingly abundantly. And then you have some over here that believes that God will never do the exceedingly abundantly. You see, there is a battle that, that we wage inside of our minds, but if we don't allow the soulish desires inside of us to be filtered through the Word of God, we'll never see our Heavenly Father as a, as a good Father. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus how to be able to pray, He said, pray in this manner, our Father. He didn't say, my Father, pray to my Father. He said, no, He's our Father. And because He's our Father, He's a good Father. And we begin to look from Heaven's perspective, because you see, that's all Daddy wants. 
He wants us to be able to understand that he's the one that ordains the steps of a righteous man. He's the one that, that goes before us and, and, and makes way for, for, for provision to come into our lives. He's the one that's literally giving um, um, thoughts inside of people's lives. You know, the Bible says that even sometimes God will cause your enemies to bless you. Sometimes even people that you thought didn't even like you, and, they, and they'll turn to you, and I've had people tell me this, I don't know why I'm doing this, but you can have the contract. I don't know why I'm doing this, but yes, I, 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 want, I want you to be able to do this, this, and this. You know what that is? That's favor. That's the favor of God. And when you begin to expect the favor of God to work inside of your life, he begins to show himself in, 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 in ways that we can't begin to understand. So he tells her, and she tells her, don't go to any of the fields and don't hang out with those other girls that were going into other fields. You see, one of the first battles that we have to be able to fight is that we have to outlive everybody's definition of us. You know what's amazing is that um, I was raised in South Florida, so most of you were not in the environment in which I was raised. I haven't always been a preacher. I gave the, my life to the Lord when I was 21 years old, and the first 21 years, it was, um, it was a little bit different. It, it certainly wasn't holy. And I'll never forget, my wife and I were in a buddy of mine. I was, we were attending a friend of mine's wedding. In the midst of that wedding, we sat around a very large table, and a good friend of mine who's the, the, the fire chief for Broward County down in, in, in Fort Lauderdale turned to Kelly, and he said, let me tell you about Eli. You see, he wanted to talk about who I was. And she turned to him and stopped him. She said, I don't want to hear that because that's not the man that I'm married to. You see, the enemy always wants to remind us of who we were. He'll send people around us to be able to remind us of who we are. But, but the Apostle Paul, who had every opportunity to be able to get caught up in condemnation and guilt, is the one that wrote in the book of Romans that there is therefore now no condemnation that are in Christ Jesus. You see, sometimes what happens is that we say yes to Christ and we allow his blood to cleanse us, but then we still walk around, walk around with the shame and the guilt of our past seasons. The Apostle Paul, who stood by and, and allowed those that were stoning Stephen, gave them permission. He held their coats so that they could stone him. He was the one that says that there is therefore now no condemnation that are in Christ Jesus. But he's also the one that wrote in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where he says that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old have passed, the new has come. You see, there is an image that God wants us to have inside of our minds and not the image of the past, not the opinions of other people, but he wants us to have the image of how he sees us as a son and a daughter of God. And as we begin to walk in that, we begin to understand that there's more to life than what we've experienced. See, old things have passed away. We can either live over here in our mom and dad's image of us of those that we ran with, or we can live over here in God's image of us. You see, he wants the old things to pass away. And here, all of a sudden, we see that Naomi, she begins to understand this, and she begins to allow a, a renewal to be happen inside of her life. But you know, sometimes outliving everybody's definition can be difficult. There in Luke chapter 4, here Jesus is in his hometown. It's the Sabbath. He's invited to be the guest speaker there at the synagogue, and they hand him the roll of Isaiah, and he reads from the 61st chapter of the book of Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closes the book, and he says, Today this is filled in your, fulfilled in your midst. And the very first words that they spoke is what stopped the blessing from coming into their lives. They took familiarity. They said, is this not the son of Joseph? You see, the enemy always wants us to, rem to remind us of our past. And sometimes he puts people around us that want to continually remind us of our past. But I believe the word of the Lord that, that was given to Naomi is the same word that is given to us. That sometimes we've got to put ourselves in a different proximity with a different crowd. Not somebody who's always telling you the things that you can't do because of the things that you did. But people that see you as a new creation. That the old is past, the new has come. One of the beautiful things about me pastoring here in, in, in Tallahassee is that um, every once in a while I have people that come and they visit and, and they knew me back when I was growing up as a kid. I have many that are watching online. 
And you know, and for many of them, they, they knew me from the past and they understood me from the past. And when I first gave my life to the Lord, they laughed. They thought it was a scam. They thought that certainly he's trying to get into the church to be able to land him one of those good church girls. And they really believed that that was the intent of my heart. But as, as days turned to weeks and weeks turned to months and months turned to year, they began to see the transformation inside of my life. They began to see me yielding to the purpose of God. They began to see me yielding to the plan of God. And all of a sudden, things began to change. My mind started becoming renewed. And my speech began to change. My focus began to change. I'll never forget, I was driving for United Parcel Service, and I had, um, came in that night, and they said, did you hear what happened? And I said, no, what happened? They said, one of our drivers today had a brain aneurysm. She was driving a truck, and um, she was in an automobile accident. She's in ICU at the hospital. So I finished out my paperwork. I went upstairs, and I changed out of my, out of my uniform, and, and I left, and I went straight for the hospital. And I walked into the hospital, and I walked right into her room, and I, and I um, took her by the hand, and I prayed for her, and just prayed for the transforming power of God to be able to move through her. Now, you have to understand something. I was working at UPS when I gave my life to the Lord. So they knew the old Eli. I, I, I traveled on a softball team, a United Parcel Service softball team, and, and we would go to tournaments. We, we would get there on Friday night, play Friday night till like 2 o'clock in the morning. We'd go all day Saturday until Sunday evening and have to drive through the night to be able to get back to South Florida to be able to start the next business day. And I remember being tore up the entire weekend. Still hit 500, 600, 700 in tournaments. They knew me. And so all of a sudden, the next morning, I come and, and to be able to start my day, and I go to clock in, and my supervisor turns to me and says, Eli, they need to be able to talk to you in the conference room. I said, who's they? The big boys. So I go into the conference room, and these are guys that I never even met. They ran all of South Florida. There was a gentleman in the room by the name of Joe Blanchard. He wrote the checks for 250,000 employees. And they turned to us, turned to me, and they said, what did you do last night? I said, well, when I got off work, I went to the hospital. And I prayed for my coworker. She made a full recovery. They turned to me and they said they would not even allow us onto that wing. How in the world did you get into that room? And I just told them, I said, listen, I believe that when a life is dedicated towards God, God will open up doors that no man can open. Right. And he'll shut doors that no man can shut. And as a matter of fact, when you live your life before God and you're directed by him, that's when the favor of God comes into your life and God can use you in ways that no man could ever use. And what amazes me is that even to that day, um, when I left United Parcel Service, well, let me back up. God, I got so many stories. Forgive me, Lord. Is it raining outside? God, I was hoping it was raining so you guys would want to stay longer. They had a no tolerance policy for overnight packages that were not delivered. And you, I was responsible. They had the packages that were, that were loaded outside my vehicle. I was responsible to count those packages right on the corner of my clipboard, how many packages I had that were overnight. And then I had to be able to put them away. And by 1030 in the morning, they had to be delivered. I had an next day air envelope that slid underneath a, a phone book that I had in my truck, and I never saw it. It never got delivered. That night, I took the phone book up, slid it back into its holder, and there was the letter. I walked into my supervisor, and I said, I got a problem. I said, this was supposed to be delivered this morning, and I just found it. And he said, that's too big for me. You got to take it upstairs. So the guy's office I went into had 450 trucks, and he was responsible for 450 routes. And I played softball with him, but I knew they had a no-tolerance policy. So I knocked on this door. He was on the phone. He waved me in. And so I go in, and I'm holding the letter in my hand. He gets off the phone. He's like, Eli, what's going on? He had seen the transformation inside of my life. He saw me surrender to the will of God for my life. And all of a sudden, I turned to him. I said, Craig, I got a problem. I said, this slid under my phone book, and I never even knew that it had not been delivered. He looked at the letter. He looked at me. I knew what the policy was. He looked at the letter again. He looked at me, and he said, we can't cry over spilled milk. Deliver it tomorrow. I found out later he was afraid to fire me because he saw such a transformation inside of my life. He thought God would get him. <laughs> we chuckle over that. But you know, as I'm standing here right now, I feel the presence of God all over me because he wants that. That's the, that's the, the mark he wants on our lives, yeah. that people can tell that we've been with Jesus. That they can tell that our lives have been transformed. That everywhere we go, supernatural favor follows us. And, and we begin to expect God to begin to move. We begin to expect him to be able to open up doors that no man can open. 
You see, that's the Heavenly Father that we're talking about in this whole series. He wants us to be able to let go of yesterday, and He wants us to be able to embrace the today and be able to move into the fullness of the master plan that He has for our lives. He doesn't want our lives to be defined by our activities. He wants our lives to be defined by Him. So here Boaz said to his servant that was in charge, who is this woman? Who is this Moabite woman? And I'm sure that those that were around him were a little bit ticked off because here all of a sudden he noticed a woman that came from a wrong background. I don't know what background you come from. Come and help me, Johnny. I don't know what background you come from, but sometimes we come from wrong backgrounds. Can I get an amen? Sometimes we come from the wrong side of the tracks. I, I, I don't know about you, but some of the boys that I ran with, their mothers told them, do not hang out with Eli. I started smoking dope when I was in the sixth grade. And my life was wild all the way till I had an encounter with God. And I had, I had parents that knew that, and they knew that I was wild. But, you know, we may come from the wrong side of the tracks, but God always notices us. I'm sure that those that, that, that were giving report to Boaz about Naomi, they specifically said that she is this young Moabite woman, almost trying to disqualify her because of where she came from. Because she comes from on the other side of the Jordan. And her, her family are all into idolatry. In other words, they were saying that, Boaz, we have some of your other women here that have been faithful to you. We have some of your other women here, Boaz, that have showed up every day. That have come early and, and, did, and, 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 and stayed late. That they never were unfaithful to you, Boaz. They didn't talk about you. They never stabbed you in the back. They've never given you even one moment's trouble. And the Bible says that all of a sudden, after that description, Boaz immediately focused upon her. Because you see, it's important for us to understand that God is setting the stage for our lives. The Apostle Paul said, eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Nor has it entered into the heart of man what God will do for those that love him. Listen to me, saints. If I can be one beggar telling another beggar where I found bread, I'm just telling you that your heavenly father has a plan for your life that supersedes anything that you can even imagine. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're 8 or 80. That plan is still on the table. And God is moving on your behalf. You know, sometimes God will allow us to get into seasons of our lives, situations in our lives that will force us to look up. To recognize that he's the one that's moving. And to recognize that we've got to submit to his will and submit to his way. So Boaz meets Ruth. And he doesn't define her over what he has seen in the back, in the past. He recognizes that she's greater. Let me just say something to you. Don't ever run after people's approval. You be who God's called you to be. How many of you know people can be fickle? You remember, you remember the, the, the apostle Paul? The Bible says that he was on the island of Malta and, and they were um, gathering firewood to be able to start a fire. And then all of a sudden he, he reaches down to the firewood and the Bible says in, in, in Acts chapter 28 that a viper attaches to his hand. And all the people around him said, oh, he, he must have the devil in him. Because people are fickle. He shook off that viper, and then five minutes later, he had no signs of that poison inside of his body. And they went from saying that he was the devil to where he was a god. You see, if your whole self-worth is based upon what other people say, you'll be like a roller coaster, up and you'll be down. Sometimes they'll say you're the greatest, and sometimes they'll say you're the worst. Jesus came into Jerusalem and they hailed him, Hosanna in the highest. In less than a week, they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. But when you come to a place where you can place your total trust in God, to be able to say, Father, you are the one that orchestrates my steps. You're the giver of life. You're, you're the one that gives me breath. I choose today to be able to put you first. The same faithfulness that we're going to see God step out into the lives of Ruth, he will show you. And you know what's amazing is that you're going to see in a couple weeks that here Ruth, in the New Testament, we find her name again as she is penned 
in the genealogies of Jesus. It doesn't matter how messed up your past is. Listen to me. It doesn't matter how messed up you are sitting right here today. You may turn to think, Pastor, man, my life is a wreck. I'm telling you that if you'll take your life and you'll place it in the hands of Almighty God, if you'll trust God like Naomi, like, like Ruth trusted God and said, your God shall be my God, your people shall be my people, God will move supernaturally inside of your life, but you've got to choose to put your trust in Him. If you put your trust in anything else, it will fail you. If you put your trust in your career, it will fail you. If you put your trust in somebody who has made you a promise, stay near me. And your success will be at hand. I'm just telling you, you will always fall short. When I walked away from UPS to be able to surrender myself to the ministry, I was on a fast track management program with them, and I was climbing very, very quickly. And the gentleman whose coattail I was climbing on was the first person that I told that I was leaving UPS, and he begged me not to leave. He said, Eli, please don't do this. Let me tell you where you'll be in seven years. Today, that gentleman runs... Well, I believe he does, or maybe he's retired. But at one point, he ran the entire air operation for them worldwide. And I turned to him, and I said, you know, I got one life to live. And his divorce with his wife was just finalized the Thursday before I was telling him. And I said, I understand that you got two precious daughters. And his eyes filled with big alligator tears. And he looked at me, and he said, Eli, you chase your dreams, and don't you ever look back. He realized he sacrificed his family for a paycheck. And you know, what I'm talking about today is not sacrificing our life for a paycheck, but giving our life to the one who holds it all. The one that will bring you joy like you've never even can experience. The one that has a love for you that will so overwhelm you. Did you see my wife this morning? She was a mess on this platform. She, couldn't, she was fighting back the tears because the one that she loves even more than me was so touching her heart that she had to back away from the microphone just to be able to soak in and, and express that love back to him. That's what we're talking about. Let me get you to stand to your feet. The Bible says that as iron sharpens iron, so does a friend sharpen the countenance of his friend. Let me say something to you. If you're new to LifeWay, and if you are new, we have a guest connect meal today where you can connect with us. You can talk to me. You can talk to our other pastoral team. Find out what we're all about. But our passion here is that when you walk out of this building, you'll know him greater than you know him. Our passion here is for you to be able to connect with something which is greater than just yourself, and that's the purpose and the plan that he has for your life. You see, I believe that Naomi, that Ruth had, had a string of decisions, and those decisions brought her to a place to where she gave birth to a child. And that child was an offspring of King David. And eventually that offspring was in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we can't even begin to understand the purpose and the plan that God has for us until we take the first step. Let me get you to grab the hand of somebody next to you. You know what I love about God is that he doesn't allow us to do it alone. The Bible says don't forsake the gathering together of the saints. Why is that? It's not that you may have perfect church attendance. It's not that you're going to have some special mansion in heaven if you come to church every Sunday. No, God understands that there is a process that we all go through, that we sharpen, we strengthen one another. You know, the enemy always wants to isolate us. How many of you all are introverts? Truthfully, tell the truth, shame the devil. Can I tell you a truth? Truth? So am I. You think, no, no, this pastor is very outgoing. I'm telling you, by nature, a good day for me is leaving the TV off. My wife and I, well, my wife will tell you that we love our evenings together. Most of the time, we're not even talking. We're sitting in proximity to each other, and we're just enjoying the silence. I love being alone. I love having quiet time with my Heavenly Father. I love not having to talk, because I think on Sunday mornings, I use all my words for the week. God's going to stretch all of us in some areas. He's going to stretch you in some areas. Allow the stretching to begin. Because I'm telling you, what he's got in store for you is going to blow your mind. you got to believe it. you got to see it. And you got to walk in it. Father, I thank you for the greatness that is assembled inside of this room. Father, these are a part of your handiwork and your craftsmanship. 
There's nobody else like them. They're a master's original. It was you, Father, that formed and fashioned them while they were in their mother's womb. And Father, this day I call them from the sidelines and I call them into the game. I call them, Father Lord, into the purpose and the plan that you have for their lives. Father, from this moment forward, Father, may they be active participants to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Father, I ask for the blessing of God, Father Lord, to be upon them, upon their homes, upon their children, upon their children's children. Father Lord, as they choose to place their trust in you, the creator of the universe, the giver of man's first breath, the one who was and is and always will be, Father, I declare and decree that your perfect plan for their lives, Father, will come to fruition. That, Father, we'll fight every devil in hell together. We'll do whatever is needed, Father, Lord, to be able to place ourselves in position to receive all that you have for us. And, Father, because you are a good Father, because you know our coming in from our going out, Father, we trust you this day and every day forward for your favor, for your blessing, for your increase, for your rebukes, for your chastening, for your sharpening to come in our lives and come through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I say something? be easily offended. We live in a society today that's so easily offended. Sometimes God will put people in your path that you need to hear what they have to say and it may not be good. But it's needed. You know what I learned? That even in the voice of my worst critic is a measure of truth. I choose to chew up the meat and spit out the bones. But you got to fight for it, saints can't be so quick to be able to say, I ain't going back to that church. Some of you are sitting in my seat. Can I say something? Ain't nobody got seats here. And at times where you're the most offended, that's when you need to be able to burrow down. And you just say, I'm not going nowhere. Because I will be all that God's called me to be. And I'll apprehend all that God has for my life. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.